Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we are um, going to talk a little bit more current, uh, a little more current uh, history, uh, some things, uh, some events that you may have already heard about. Uh, and so, um, we're hopefully this is like, oh, yeah, I, I've heard that before because uh, it's somewhat relevant still today. Um, so today's title is uh, Communism Spreads in East Asia. So if you know, if you remember our, our map quizzes and remember what countries are in East Asia and what countries are communists, there you go. Chapter 15, section three. That was your warm up. So objectives, we're gonna understand communism under Mao Zedong in China. We're gonna analyze the course of war in Korea. And we're gonna predict, predict why the spread of communism in East Asia was worrisome for global government leaders. Again, these topics discussed in today's lecture can be used for some of those topics in your Cold War research project. All right, so where we at though in the world, this is shortly after um, World War II ended. You have the Soviet Union, you have the Chinese communists, you have um, North Korea, which is a Soviet satellite, you have South Korea, you have Japan and the U.S. occupation, um, occupation, occupation, occupation. So you have Taiwan. Here you have a mix. And you have nationalist China in the south. Okay, so this is what it kind of looks like, right? Right. All right. All right. So China's communist revolution. So I mentioned it uh, yesterday or the, the, other, the other lecture that before World War II, China kind of had their own civil war. And when the Japanese invaded uh, Manchuria 1931, um, and they realized how over, overwhelming it was, they decided to put their bickering aside and combine and fight against the Japanese. So by the end of World War II, Chinese, go, uh, Chinese communists had gained much control over Northern China. Again, like I just said, after Japan's defeat, communist forces led by Mao Zedong fought a civil war against nationalists led by um, then ruler Jiang Zixi or Chiang Kai-shek. Um, I learned him as Chiang Kai-shek. Um, your book mentions him as Jiang Zixi. Sorry if I butcher names. I apologize. Accents are not my strong suit. Um, battles raged until Mao's force swept to victory and set up the People's Republic of China, the PRC. Uh, the defeated nationalists fled to the island of Taiwan, Formosa, that's what it used to be called, Formosa, and they call it Taiwan, off the Chinese coasts. And after decades of struggle, China now was finally under communist, total communist control. And here you have a picture of Zedong and a... This is kind of a, I mean, for it being communist, it is a cool picture, uh, historically speaking, because you have, I don't know who this person is. I don't know. Maybe some extra credit, find out who this person is in the next to, uh, I believe this is Marx. So who's this person? Because that's a nose, right? Or am I just... Uh, or am I seeing things? Yeah, I, I think I'm seeing things. Anyways, this is Marx. This is Engels. This is Lenin. This is Stalin. This is Mao. Communism 
evolution, if you want to call it. Uh, this is Jiang Zixi, Chiang Kai-shek with FDR and Winston Churchill. Uh, and this is the PRC, People's Republic of China. Um, there you go. Here's Taiwan. So how the communists won, uh, there are several reasons why. One, Mao had the support of China's huge peasant population. Peasants had long suffered under the brutal landlords and high taxes, uh, barely, you know, surviving um, after, you know, growing all the food to feed an enormous country and then being taxed and only having so little left behind. The communists redistributed redistributed lands to poor peasants and ended oppression by these landlords. And nationalists were losing popularity because their policies had led to widespread economic hardship. Kind of like um, Herbert Hoover and the Republican Party, uh, which were in charge during the Great Depression at around this time, you know, wait, no, before this time, obviously, World War II, we're after World War II, uh, but the Great Depression in the United States and FDR got a lot of popularity because he said he was going to fix the economy. So when your leaders aren't helping you out, back then they would fight. In, here, in, in other countries, they fight over it. Um, and yeah, uh, many uh, resented the corruption of Xi Xi's government and the government's dependence on Western imperialist powers. They hoped the, that the communists would build a new China and end foreign domination. There was widespread support of communism in the countryside. Communists helped capture rail lines and surround nationalist held cities. One after another, Mao's Liber People's Liberation Army, the PLA, uh, emerged victorious after the victory over the nationalists. They conquered Tibet in 1950. And in 1959, Tibet's revered le religious leader, the Dalai Lama, was forced to flee the country because they don't want him to die. Um, here you have their People's Liberation Army. I believe they're marching through and they're looking at Mao while well, the camera was taken. All right, camera was taken, the picture was taken. Um, Mao Zedong let, built a communist one-party totalitarian state in the People's Republic of China. Communist ideologies guide the government's effort to reshape the economy and society that China had inherited from their dynastic period. The communist government uh, discouraged the practice of Buddhism, Confucianism, and other traditional Chinese beliefs. Remember, communists don't necessarily, I wouldn't say they're atheists, but um, they don't necessarily associate themselves with religion, right? So the communists are going to discourage these long, uh, long lived uh, traditional uh, religious beliefs of their forefathers. In the meantime, the government will seize property of the rural landlords and urban business owners throughout China. Opponents of communists were put out as counter-revolutionaries. Counter Many thousands of people who had belonged to the property middle, middle class or the bourgeoisie were accused of counter-revolutionary beliefs. They would be beaten, sent to labor camps, or killed. Who does that sound like? Uh, with the Soviets' help, the Chinese built dams and factories to boost agriculture. Like I said, <coughs> Mao is going to redistribute lands to peasants at first. Then he called for collectivization, uh, which forced the pooling of peasant land and labor to increase productivity. The Great Leap Failure. Um, so from 1958 to 1960, Mao led a program called the Great Leap Forward. He urged people to make a, quote, superhuman effort to increase farm and industrial output across China. In order to make it more efficient, he created communes to boost agriculture. Stop me if this sounds familiar again. 
A typical commune brought together several villages, thousands of acres of land, and up to around 25,000 people. And rural communes would, would set up small-scale backyard industries to produce steel and other products, not, you know, factory forged and made. But the Great Leap Forward proved to be a failure. These backyard industries turned out low quality, useless goods. The commune actually cut the food output partly by removing incentives for individual farmers and families leading to neglect of farmland and food shortages. Again, what does this sound like? Uh, also bad weather and uh, soil erosion is gonna lead to problems and to a famine. Um, and between 1959 and 1961, as many as uh, 55 million people are thought to have starved to death. Oh, you already know. Uh, extra credit question. Um, how many people? You might have to do some searching, uh, but try and find a, I wouldn't say a solidified estimate, because this is just an estimate, right? As many as. Um, we don't know. So that's, and that's something, you know, information about this and other um, things that happen in China aren't really, aren't really known. So we can only speculate and that's kind of what your textbook does. So try and look this up. How many people uh, died during, or as a result of the Great Leap Forward? Okay, and maybe maybe find out what the population was at the time, you know, 1958, when he, what was the population of China at that time in 1958, and how many died as a result? All right, so there you go. Find it for me. So here you have a commune, and I believe, this looks like grain or rice paddy field. I, I, I'm, couldn't tell you, but these are, they look like women working in the field. All right, cultural disturbance. Um, so China slowly will recover from the Great Leap Forward by reducing the size of communes and taking a more practical approach to the economy in 1966. However, Mao launched the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. And its goal was to purge China of bourgeois tendencies. He will urge young Chinese to experience revolution firsthand as his generation had. And in response, teenagers will form bands called Red Guards. They will wave copies of this little red book titled Quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong, or that I, that's his uh, non-American, non-translated name. Um, Red Guards attack those who they consider to be bougie, bourgeois. Uh, the accused were publicly humiliated, beaten, and even sometimes killed. Skilled workers and managers were forced to leave their jobs to do manual labor on rural farms or in forced labor camps. Again, stop me when this sounds familiar. Uh, schools and factories closed, the economy slowed, civil war threatened, Mao finally had to restore had the army restore order the little kids got out of hand so you know this cultural revolution was to you know kind of kick out the foreigners and you know i'm gonna sadly say this make china great again but you know here you have some of the red guard reading their reading their quotes of the little red book here you have um, another group of kids, teenagers, boys and girls. So an unhealthy relationship. In 1949, the triumph of the communists in China seemed like a win for the Soviet Union and a loss for the USA. China's role in the Cold War, however, proved to be more complex than the simple expansion of communist power. The People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union were uneasy allies in the 50s. Stalin will send economic aid and technical experts to help China modernize, but distrust between the two created tensions. 
Some tensions will, people don't forget. <laughs> Some tensions dated back to territorial disputes between Tsarist Russia and dynastic China. Really now. They can't just be friends. By 1960, border clashes and disputes over ideology, they're the same kind of government, right? Uh, will lead to the Soviets to withdraw aid and all advisors from China. Um, Western fears of uh, a strong alliance between the Soviet Union and the PRC actually proved to be unfounded because they broke up. Um, relations between, between China and the U.S. were more complex. Like I said, after Jiang Zixi, like I told you, Chiang Kai-shek uh, fled to Taiwan. The U.S. supported his nationalist government in the as the rightful representative of China. Washington, Washington, D.C., Congress, this national government, whatever you want to call them, refused diplomatic recognition of mainland PRC as American leaders saw them as a communist threat to all Asia. As the Cold War dragged on, the U.S. took a different approach to the PRC from an American standpoint. There's a strategic advantage to improving relations with communist China by playing the China card. The U.S. could isolate the Soviet Union between NATO in the West and a hostile China in the East. Uh, and the U.S. allowed the People's Republic of China to replace Taiwan in the United Nations, 1971. So come on over. Help us out. Help us uh, go against the Soviet Union. So... That's what they wanted. Eh, see, I wouldn't say secretly, but you know, it is what it is. U.S. President Richard Nixon actually visited Mao formally. And in 1979, the U.S. set up formal diplomatic ties with China. It took a while, but we were able to do that successfully. Here's Mao with Richard Nixon. What would that be? Um, 1968, somewhere around there. What about us? Uh, Jiang Zixi's government continued to rule Taiwan under martial law as a one-party dictatorship. Not until the 80s did Taiwan's government end martial law and allow oppositional parties. Mainland China saw Taiwan as a breakaway province and threatened military action. Uh, when Taiwanese politicians proposed declaring the island's formal independence. They didn't like that. In the long term, the PRC insisted that Taiwan rejoin China. Again, Taiwan's government will resist. So here you have a political cartoon of mainland China trying to grab Taiwan under their grasp. And as you know, they, Taiwan has a, has a painted nails signifying female of oh, uh, the weaker, to them, the weaker sex, right? Um, can't touch this, they're locked. Uh, all right, so we're gonna skirt skirt to Korea um, and the story goes. The nation of Korea occupies the peninsula on China's northeastern border. Like East and Western Germany, Korea was split in two by the rival forces after World War II. And like other divisions, the two Koreas found themselves on opposite sides of the Cold War. Korea had been an independent kingdom until Japan conquered it by the early 20th century. Uh, after Japan's defeat in World War II, the Soviet and American forces agreed to divide Korea temporarily along what's called the 38th parallel line, latitude, flatitude, if you can remember that. North Korea was ruled by dictator, then dictator, Kim Il-sung, who was the communist ally of the Soviet Union. South Korea was ruled by a dictator, but he wasn't communist. His name was Syngman Rhee. That's Korea before uh, takeover by the Japanese. This is Korea after World War II. Uh, you have North Korea and South Korea. 
38th parallel. This is Kim Il Sung. I don't know if that's an edited photo. And this is Singman Rhee with Douglas MacArthur. Um, and here's the South Korean national flag. So early in the Korean War, both leaders wanted to rule their entire country. In the early 1950, Kim Il-sung called for a, her a heroic struggle to reunite Korea. So North Korean troops attacked in June 1950, and they soon overran most of the south part of the peninsula. The United Nations Security Council condemned this attack. Remember, the Security Council was made up of the Soviet Union, China, which was then Taiwan. Um, is it Britain, France, right? They condemn it from the United Nations, right? The U.S. then organized a U.N. force to help South Korea. Here is where the U.N. and the League of Nations totally differ. There was no formal standing army for the League of Nations. And here, albeit the, um, the U.S. were the main suppliers of troops to help South Korea, there was also some other, I, I want to say there was like Italian, French, British uh, soldiers that helped fight the communists in North Korea during the Korean War. This is also called the Korean War, F, F, BT dubs. <laughs> it says it right there in the title, Mr. Levi, you silly goose. Uh, the UN forces were mainly, like I said, US and South Koreans. Um, U.S. troops arrived early in, not early, they arrived in July. North Korea continued to roll through until U.N. forces stopped them in August along the line of the Pusan perimeter. Uh, there, they were centered on the city of the port of Pusan, which is in the southeastern corner of China. In September, United Nations troops landed at the beaches of the port of Incheon, um, which was behind enemy lines. And it was led by your boy, Douglas MacArthur. It was like a little sneak attack, a little sneakeroo. The U.S. led troops will capture Korea's north and south railroad lines and cut off North Korean troops from their supplies of ammo and food. North Korean forces in the South had to soon surrender. And by November, UN forces had pushed all the way north to the Yalu River, which is the border of North Korea and China. Ruh -roh. Uh, the US and MacArthur kind of went too far because the US successes in Korea alarmed China, which is, as you know, communist. So in late 1950, Mao Zedong sent hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops to help the North Koreans. Again, the U.S. is not directly fighting the Soviets. Again, Cold War, proxy wars. Um, in a tough, tough winter, the Chinese and North Korean troops pushed the U.N. troops back across the 38th parallel the Korean War is going to turn into a stalemate in 1950, I believe. In 1951, it was kind of over, but the war, uh, the armistice was signed in 1953. Remember, armistice is uh, an agreement to stop the fighting. Nearly 2 million North Koreans and South Koreans remain dug in trenches on either side of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, an area where no military forces uh, could be. Um, and that's uh, near the original 38th parallel line. The armistice held for the rest of the Cold War. However, no peace treaty was ever negotiated. And I believe that is still, in fact, to this day. Um, I can't get my finger in there. Extra credit question. Is this armistice 
still into effect? Or is Mr. Ovalle wrong and there is an actual formal treaty signed? Find that out if you want extra credit. Um, so here you go. This is kind of a, a, a map of how the fighting went early on. The North Koreans overrun to Pusan. MacArthur attacks at Incheon and moves his way north to the Yalu River. China and North Korea force them back, and then they force themselves back. No, no, no. So look at this. Here's the 38th parallel. And look how much land was gained by each side. So much land. Uh, here you have the DMZ or the demilitarized zone, which is right. This is right here. And there's no uh, military uh, effort. Action was allowed to cross this buffer. Here's what it looks like today, barren wasteland. And this is what it looks like today. Um, you have North Korea on one side, South Korea on the other. And they stare at each other forever. So you have two Koreas. Like the two Germanys, North and South Korea developed separately after the armistice. North Korea as a communist command economy, South Korea as a capitalist market economy. The capitalist portion of the country had an economic boom and rising, rising standard of living, while the communist portion went through an economic stagnation and decline. Like in Germany, the U.S. gave economic aid to capitalist South Korea, and the communists helped the, com <laughs> the communists. The Soviets helped the communist North Korea. Unlike Western Germany, South Korea was governed by a series of dictators and military rulers during most of the civil civil Cold War. As long as they were communists, and we had open markets in for trade in South Korea, they had bigger fish to fry. Honestly. And unlike East Germany, where a series of officials led a communist government, a single dictator uh, controlled North Korea throughout the Cold War and would then pass it off to his son, Kim Il-jong, who then passed it off to his son, Kim Jong-un. Um, whereas Germany was reunited after the Cold War, Korea remained divided. After the war, slow, uh, South Korea slowly rebuilt its economy. By the mid 60s, South Korea's economy leapt ahead. After decades of dictatorship and military rule, a prosperous middle class, the fierce student protests pushed the government to hold direct elections in 1987. Despite this bloody conflict, many South Koreans want to see their nation uh, be united. Again, they have the same language, history, and traditions. It only would make sense, right? But under Kim Il-sung, the command economy increased output for a time in North Korea. Again, kind of like in uh, the Soviet Union, where for a time, you know, Stalin's five-year plans kind of helped the economy. But then over time, communism tends to peter out. A hey, peter. Um, Kim's emphasis on self-reliance kept North Korea isolated and poor. The government built a cult of personality around Kim, who was constantly referred to as the great leader in propaganda. Even after the USSR and Chinese allies undertook economic reforms in the 1980s, North Korea clung to hardline communism, and it is still communist to this day. So um, that is fun. That is fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, anyways, um, that concludes this lecture. Uh, your homework is page 527, three through five. Um, if you if you like that lecture, make sure you smash that like button for for your teacher, for your boy. Uh, and as always, stay safe. Wash your hands. Peace.